All right, greetings everybody. Welcome to another seminar for APES 450, current issues in the strawberry industry. Uh, I'm excited to have Dr. Kelly Ivers with us today. And uh, I wanna welcome Kelly back to Cal Poly. And I say, uh, welcome her back because she was really critical in getting the Strawberry Center started here. She was actually the first person that uh, was hired to start the Strawberry Center. And I came a couple of, a few months later, was it March of 2014, Kelly, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so we actually knew each other at NC State where she was an assistant and an associate professor of plant pathology. We were in the same department. Um, she got her bachelor's of science and master's science degrees at Texas A&M. She did a PhD at Penn State uh, in plant pathology and then a postdoc at UC Berkeley. And, uh, and then after she uh, was working at NC State, she came here to Cal Poly. And now she's at Driscoll's. I think it's been at least two years. Is that right, Kelly? Um, it'll be uh, three years. Three years. June 18th. Time flies. Well, <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Ivers is a senior plant pathologist at Driscoll's. She's uh, traveling all over the world addressing uh, plant pathology issues on the berry crops that are grown. And she's going to talk to us today about disease identification and management of those diseases in strawberries. Kelly, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Dr. Holmes. Um, I'd like to think that this is a casual format. So um, if you guys have questions, do they raise their hands, Dr. Holmes, or can they talk? You know, some formats are different. Yeah, so uh, there's a hand raising function in uh, one of them is, so let's see here, you can either, yeah, you can raise your hand like I just did. A little yellow hand comes up in the corner. Okay. Uh, or if you just, you know, if you raise your hand, I can see you and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Dr. Ivers can field a question. Yeah, so if you have a question, if you're interested in a particular disease that I'm talking about, you can stop me and we'll try to talk about it right when I address it, if you'd like. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about myself um, before I start my lecture or my presentation. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, how I discovered plant pathology and some of my experiences. And so you get to know me a little bit more and then we'll talk about some of the important strawberry diseases. So, um, I actually taught undergrad plant pathology at Cal Poly, and that was the book um, on the right. So um, my cats always hated it when I got my plant pathology book out. Um, so uh, I was an undergraduate at Texas A&M, and then I went on to get my master's degree. But as an undergraduate, I really wanted some laboratory experience. So I went to a couple of professors in my department it was the Department of uh, Plant Pathology and Microbiology, and I asked them for some lab experience. I wanted to work in a lab. So um, there was a forest pathology lab. Um, Texas has a lot of oaks. Uh, so there was a forest pathology lab that, uh, that could use some help. So I wound up as an undergraduate working on a plant pathogen and realized how much I liked it. So I never grew up to think that I was going to be a plant pathologist. I thought maybe I was interested in environmental engineering or environmental science. And I realized that I really enjoyed working with plants, working outside, working in the lab, working with people. Um, so I decided to stick with that department and get my master's degree. And I focused on two different diseases. I worked on an, a, a tree disease called oak wilt, which um, is really um, problematic in certain parts of Texas where they do a lot of cattle grazing because the trees provide a lot of shade. And, um, and then there was an opportunity to work in another lab on um, a disease called Texas root rot. And at that time it was called Phymatotricum. Now it's called Phymatotricum uh, opsis. They changed the, the terminology, but so I worked on an apple disease. Um, and so you can see the 
the big losses um, in the, the most southern apple production region in the United States. So after I got my master's degree, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't ready for a PhD, so I decided to work for a little bit. And I worked at uh, Oregon State University and the USDA on several projects that involved soil-borne diseases. And this was right when there was funding for the phase out of methyl bromide um, in the 1990s. And so I worked on methods for managing soil-borne diseases alternative. And one of the things they were interested in is solarization. So this was before ASD, um, but solarization to, uh, to look at heating the soil in Oregon, which the temperatures are a lot cooler. And as well, I learned a lot about nematodes and uh, did some nematode surveys in Oregon vineyards. So I realized that I missed um, graduate school. I wanted to go back. So I uh, decided to pursue my PhD and I went to school at Penn State University. And Pennsylvania is the largest producer, producer of commercial mushrooms, button mushrooms, um, the pizza mushrooms or Agaricus bisporus is the genus name. There are several pathogens of the commercial button mushroom, one of which is trichoderma, which is often used as a biocontrol fungus, but here it's actually uh, biocontrolling the, the crop we're trying to grow. So I learned a lot about composting. I learned a lot about um, compost pathogens and also mu uh, mushroom production. So um, after that, I wasn't ready for a faculty position. I kind of missed the West Coast. And so I went back to California and um, decided that um, I would do a postdoc. And so I did a postdoc for two and a half years. Um, I had the great opportunity to be a visiting scientist. So I worked over in Wageningen in the Netherlands for a while. And I got to work on the first genome sequence of Phytophthora. So I got to um, work on Phytophthora remorum, which is uh, causes sudden oak death. And you guys maybe have heard about it if you've been in the Bay Area. Um, and so I actually helped publish a science article because I was the person that did the DNA, um, extracted the DNA and chose the isolate and uh, got to, to work on the genome sequence. Um, so I applied for jobs and I was lucky enough to get a position at NC State University. However, I was in the Western part of the state and I was an extension specialist um, as well as an assistant and then associate professor. I had multiple crops that I worked on, um, many crops in the Western part of the state. I actually um, met Gerald Holmes then. He was the vegetable and sweet potato pathologist at NC State. And so um, we uh, had some crossover on some crops and um, I learned a lot about diagnostics. And so you can see there's a picture. NC State had the plant disease and insect clinic and way back when it was first founded, they did a lot of tobacco research. So you can see the, the um, professor smoking tobacco in the lab. And then um, they did uh, just, NC State is known for its extension, working a lot with growers. And so I just wanted to show you a couple of historical pictures as well as some of the trials I was involved in. Um, so I was there for 10 years and I really missed California. And I jumped at the opportunity to work with the Strawberry Commission on this new endeavor for the uh, Cal Poly Strawberry Center. And um, so as Dr. Holmes said, I came first, but um, he was hired just shortly after I was. And we were really excited that we knew each other and that we had worked with each other prior. So um, I really liked or uh, thought that I would like the opportunity to work with the California Strawberry Commission because they uh, fund large amounts of research. Um, they put assessment money into uh, funding research and education of various important um, topics within the California strawberry industry. And so um, I loved it. I really enjoyed my time. Um, and we got to use the fields at Cal Poly and got to know the students and um, it was really exciting. And so I was there for about four years and then um, Driscoll's recruited me. And so now I'm at Driscoll's and um, we have a plant pathology team that's within the global plant health department. And um, we have an entomologist and then my boss is a plant pathologist. Her name is Jenny Broom. 
And we have several different groups of uh, research, different teams within the plant pathology uh, group. So we have someone that covers clean stock, which is really important if you're a global company and you're moving plant material, your proprietary genetics, um, and you're involved in nursery production, um, then clean stock is really important. And um, there, it's all about developing SOPs and protocols and making sure that people are following them. And then we have a nursery team and that nursery team uh, works with our nurseries that produce our, our genetics of all four berries. Um, they do routine scouting and um, systematic sampling to make sure that the growers that receive this material um, get good material. And then um, I'm in charge of the fruit production group. And so there are a couple of us that work with fruit producers so instead of working with the nursery plant producers, we work with growers all over the world um, on the four berry crops doing diagnostics and disease management research. So I have to know diseases on blueberries in Australia um, and I have to understand the, the, the mechanisms for managing them. I've started to learn all about uh, the different fungicides that are available in the different countries and um, also post-harvest issues when we ship our fruit. Like for instance, um, in uh, Peru, we produce a lot of blueberries, uh, more blueberries than people in South America can eat. So they ship those to various countries. And I have to be aware of the post-harvest issues like botrytis and help our growers manage them before the fruit are packed and then during transit. Um, and then the third team that we have within, well, I guess it's the fourth that we have within our group um, is the host resistance team. That lead, that position is currently open. They actually just made an offer. So um, these, this group works with our breeders on the pathology targets. So for strawberries, you know, their target would be Phytophthora, Anthracnose, Verticillium, Etc. So they have a number of different targets for each of the berry crops that they do phenotyping and um, host resistance screening. So basically they want to know what varieties are susceptible to what diseases. Um, so just to give you an idea, and again, we do travel. Um, we have a company plane. We don't go very far in it, but I've had to go to Mexico recently. And um, so we, um, just to kind of show that my position is global and um, I am learning so much and there's so much I still don't know. So, um, so that's a little bit about myself. So that was a little bit over 10 minutes. Um, I wanna go ahead and talk about uh, strawberry diseases. And um, I thought that this was a really appropriate title slide because um, even though Driscoll's produces more than strawberries, I am spending a lot of my time on strawberry diseases and working with agronomists on disease management. And so, um, so I like this slide. Um, I've always called it our problem child, even before I gave this presentation. So in case you don't know very much about Driscoll's, um, it is a private company. So there's, we're not on the stock market. Um, we produce just four berry crops. Uh, strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, and blueberry. And um, we produce them globally, meaning that there are certain locations that we grow and sell them from. So um, I'm gonna mainly focus on North America and the United States when, and when I talk about the diseases, I'm gonna really just talk about California diseases. Um, but I am gonna show you just a few slides uh, so that you understand a little bit. And I'll start out with strawberry um, so that you understand where we produce our plants. So if you buy a strawberry in the United States and you buy a conventional strawberry and it is currently May um, as it is uh, right now, you will see that there are several growing locations where your strawberries might come from. Now this is when strawberries are being harvested and being sold. So the production season is obviously going to be a few more months before when there um, occurs a few more months before when we actually get strawberry fruit. 
But right now, if you were to get a Driscoll's clam shell, and actually, if you were to get a strawberry clam shell anywhere in the United States, um, because this is very typical of the strawberry industry, um, you would be getting strawberries from Oxnard, Santa Maria, Watsonville, and Salinas, or at the very tail end of central Mexico. Now, central Mexico and Florida have very similar climates. It's very humid there, and they are not able to produce fruit in the summer, and that's because of the temperatures. However, if you do think about the climate, the really interesting thing about the climate is sometimes it's really hard to produce organic fruit in really um, in climates that are uh, subtropical like Florida. And so if you notice, we produce uh, strawberries in Florida, but we do not produce organic strawberries in Florida. And that's because there are several disease and insect issues that make it very difficult. Um, likewise, in return, um, if you were to look at Baja, California, we only grow organic strawberries in Baja and we do not grow conventional strawberries in Baja. And some of that has to do with climate, but some of it has to do with the cost to produce strawberries because Baja is very, um, has a, a water shortage and water can be very expensive. And so uh, strawberries are produced mainly for the organic market in, in Baja, Mexico. And the main town that we, or the main location that we produce strawberries is in an area called San Catin, which is about four hours south of Tijuana. So it's centrally located on the coast. It looks just like California, you're just a few miles away from the coast. So it still likes that, that Mediterranean like climate. So anyway, so these are the locations if you were to buy berries um, of where they would come from in the United States if you were to buy them. So likewise, um, I've put the strawberries at the top and these are just conventional. Um, I just thought I would show you the blueberries, the blackberries and the raspberries. So we'll start at the raspberries at the bottom. If you notice, they're the exact same locations that strawberries are sold, right? Or that are grown. So we grow our raspberries in Watsonville and Salinas, Santa Maria, Oxnard, Baja, and Central Mexico. Um, it's similar with the other crops, except if you notice blueberry, there are several other locations where we actually um, uh, produce blueberries that are sold in the United States. For instance, um, we also produce blueberry in South America, in Chile and Peru, but that is predominantly done to fill the winter market. To, so to fill that void of not having a lot of blueberries at that particular time. So I hope that uh, some of this makes sense. So now that I've talked a little bit about our production areas, um, just within the, it would take me a whole seminar to talk about all the different uh, countries that we produce in. But so I thought I would just focus on the United States at this point. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fruit production diagnostics. And um, I'm going to use 2018 and 2019 as examples. Um, when I first got to Driscoll's at 2018, we decided that we would write a report, um, a diagnostic report to kind of um, uh, go over some of the, the things that stand out with the diagnostics. And so if you notice, um, I have listed the different di uh, diagnostics by crop. So we have blackberry, blueberry, raspberry, and strawberry, and then the percent of total cases for each year. And the main thing or the main point that I wanna make with this slide is that strawberries represent over 50% of the samples that we receive in the diagnostic lab. And what's really interesting is that there are several diseases on strawberry, which are very easy to diagnose, like gray mold on strawberry fruit and uh, powdery mildew. And so these cases represent mainly the soil and crown diseases of strawberry. Um, most of the cases of raspberry were phytophthora. Blueberry was very variable because uh, we produce in so many regions. And then we have a major fusarium disease on blackberry. So um, I didn't uh, want to spend the time to go through all of the main diseases that we have in each crop, 
But my point is, is that strawberry is definitely our problem child. Um, we have a lot of uh, samples that, that come that represent strawberry. So I've heard some people say that strawberries just want to die. That's a little bit um, uh, exclamatory, I guess. Um, so I've sorted the, the, the cases out in a different way. Um, as a plant pathologist working in industry, you have a number of different clientele. So obviously we work with fruit producers, but there's other people that are producing plants or that are growing fruit. Um, and so we often get samples from our breeders with new cultivars, trying to figure out what's going on when they deploy a new cultivar in our region. Um, and even though we know it's host resistance um, levels, um, sometimes uh, we'll be surprised. So we get a fair number of samples from our test plots from our breeders. And then we have test plots all over the world and um, we will get samples from various research trials. Um, I've also highlighted some of the locations where we've received samples from. Now, we do work with local plant pathologists um, in the various locations, and we also work with external labs. So, um, so we don't get a ton of samples from outside the United States unless they're high profile, like they're having a serious disease or they're not getting the, um, the resolution in the diagnostics from the local laboratories. And I actually have got a fair amount of samples of raspberry uh, international samples because there seems to be an issue with um, international labs being able to detect Phytophthora. So there are some still issues that we actually train those diagnostic labs to, so that they can learn how to better service our growers. Um, because again, berries are specialty crops and um, there's not that many people that, um, that specifically work on berries or raspberry or strawberry. And so sometimes they'll tell you things like, oh, there's alternaria on your plants. And you know that that's a secondary. So um, it can be difficult to get diagnostics globally. So just to kind of give you an idea of, of who the clientele I'm referring to. I wanted to show you our 2021 load. So this is as of yesterday, I did a screenshot. Um, and so these are our global diagnostics and I have been inundated with strawberry samples. And um, so, uh, and it's not even the middle of the year yet. And we haven't even seen some of our major soil borne diseases pop up yet. So I have been getting a fair number of strawberry samples. So it is totally our pro it's having a temper, temper tantrum. Strawberries are having temper tantrums this year. And um, I'm, I, um, uh, I look forward to getting some other crops sometimes. So anyway, so just to kind of give you an idea of, of uh, what we are getting as of this year. Does anybody have any questions on diagnostics or where we grow plants or before I start kind of talking about some of the major strawberry pathogens, does anybody want to ask me any questions? I have a quick one. What's the main problem with uh, other places not being able to detect Phytophthora? Are they just using a different technique and they're missing it? Yeah, so the detection of Phytophthora requires selective media. And the, one of the medias that we use, the mediums we use is called PARP, P-A-R-P. And those letters stand for different uh, antibiotics. And one of the P stands for PCMB. Well, PCMB is a really old fungicide that is outlawed in Mexico and is no longer used in many countries. And so even if they have a Sigma or a chemical supplier, it can be really expensive or difficult to find that PCMB. But if you don't put the PCMB in the medium, you will get uh, Rhizoctonia and um, occasionally you'll get Fusarium and some of these other secondaries. And then that's when they say, oh, you have a Fusarium on your plant when you know you've never identified Fusarium. We don't have a Fusarium disease on raspberry. We just don't, it doesn't exist. 
And, um, and so when you see that diagnostic, you, you second guess some of that. So some of it has to do with countries being able to get the ingredients to make the selective media. And really it's their expertise. Berries, like I said, are very special. Our specialty crop, I mean, if you were to count all the strawberry pathologists in the United States, how many would there be, Gerald? Probably. You could probably count them on one hand, right? <laughs> right. So um, they're really a special crop. Um, can I ask a question following up the part? Yeah. Uh, media. So um, I am actually working on uh, the plant pathology lab. I am the grad student. And um, yeah, I can, uh, from our part, I can see fusarium sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that happens. So that will be like secondary. Yes, it's okay. secondary. And then the issue with fusarium is that we have pathogenic strains and then we have non-pathogenic strains. And morphologically in culture, you can't distinguish them. So, okay. And yeah, but you can identify the fusarium. And most of the time, um, you can limit that if you make sure that your tissue is fully submerged and that your media isn't too old and that your media is kept in the dark. So the main reason why you find fusarium on part plates is the pimericin or the natamycin, which is the same product that Dr. Holmes is working on called Zivion. It is a broad spectrum fungicide, that, um, but it's light sensitive. And so the reason why the strawberry industry hasn't adopted it is because it's not in a formulation to spray on plants um, commercially. Otherwise it would probably control powdery mildew and other diseases. And so that pimericin or that natamycin needs to stay in the dark. And sometimes if you leave your plates out, because I do, I transfer stuff onto my plates and then I put them somewhere, but I don't sometimes put them in the dark. And then over time that, uh, that fusarium will start to grow on the part media. So sometimes it's just a storage thing. And see, people don't even realize that. Like I'm a Phytophthora expert and um, most people don't recognize that, but those, the, the selective media can be really important for, um, for finding really difficult to isolate things. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Yunchen. Nice to meet you. So, Dr. Ivers, what do you do to keep your plates from getting exposed to light and degrading the natamycin? Do you wrap them in aluminum foil or keep them in the fridge, or what do you do? We have a box that we put our um, a cardboard box. <laughs> okay. For Something technological. High tech. We and we put um, our NP10 and our. Um, I don't know if the NP10 is, is as light sensitive, but we have a cardboard box that we put any of our selective media in and that's to help. And like, if you know, when you look at the antibiotics that you buy, if they come in a brown bottle or uh, um, a plastic bottle that's not clear, then chances are it could be light sensitive. So yeah, so we um, put our plates in a box or sometimes you can put them in a cabinet. You can put them in the crispers and then put them in the cabinet. We'll have to save our money up for a cardboard box. I know, right? <laughs> um, all right, so I'll go ahead. I have woo, 20 minutes. I have 20 minutes to talk about um, the important diseases in strawberry production. So um, there are several straw, uh, pathogens that attack the uh, crown or the root of the strawberry plant. And um, those would be uh, verticillium wilt, macrophemina, charcoal rot, uh, fusarium wilt, phytophthora, and anthracnose. And if you notice, the anthracnose has part of it is the text is in red. And that's because anthracnose can also impact our fruit. Um, and then we have a few foliar diseases. I mean, there are several others, but I, these are probably the most important pathogens in California of strawberry. These are the ones that I focus on. And I've actually, um, people um, may disagree with me, but um, not from the situation I'm in, but I actually feel that verticillium wilt is still the most important strawberry disease in California because that represents more cases that we receive than others. And I'm going to explain a little bit about verticillium wilt um, so uh, people can see my point of view. 
Um, and uh, but I, I'm happy to be challenged by other people. So I'm going to talk about some of these diseases. And I'm first I'm going to focus on um, the soil borne diseases. So I'm going to talk about verticillium and macrophemina and fusarium. Some of you guys, at least the strawberry students, the pathology students have heard some of these stories before, but um, some others might not. So there was a person named Wilhelm um, in the 60s and actually even in the late 50s who had discovered that a chemical, a fumigant named methyl bromide, when it was mixed with chloropicrin, it reportedly um, controlled verticillium wilt of strawberry. So verticillium wilt of strawberry has is been a very old foe to strawberries in California, as well as many other states. When I worked in uh, North Carolina, we had uh, verticillium dahlia out there that attacked several crops. Um, so um, this was not just in California, but verticillium dahlia was a pathogen of several crops. And it was one of the primary reasons why growers decided to fumigate their tomatoes and their strawberries and some of their high value specialty crops. So um, since that discovery, it has been used as a pre-plant eradicate in nearly all conventional strawberry plantings in California until just a few years ago. And I'll explain that in a second. So, this is a picture of the number of acres planted to strawberry in California. It starts in 1970 by different districts. And so you can see at 1970, we were under 10,000 acres of strawberry in California. Then you go up a decade and it's close to 20,000 acres. Then you go another decade and it gets to about 25, close to 30,000. And then it reached its peak in um, uh, the 2010s, um, probably um, right when the Strawberry Center was started, um, uh, strawberry production, I wanna say it got up to at least 40,000 acres. And I know now that we have really high yielding varieties, there's less acreage, but we produce more fruit. And so um, why did this happen? This happened because one, we adopted the use of fumigants, and two, we had selective breeding programs. So we had breeding programs that um, started focusing in on day neutral cultivars. So these are cultivars that uh, flower during the summer. So they're not um, short day cultivars. They flower during the summer so that you can have year round strawberry production. So uh, the, the large increase in acreage of strawberries is largely due again to these two things. So this might be, you know, a question that you get asked about, or um, what what have been some of the important developments in the California strawberry ish industry? And I would say that these two are key to its success. So um, as I mentioned, when I was in Oregon, they uh, wanted to find alternatives to methyl bromide. So there was um, a protocol, it was called the Montreal Protocol, and it mandated that farmers stopped using methyl bromide by 2005. And this mainly had to do with its role in ozone depletion. Um, so since 2005, we have still used methyl bromide um, by uh, a process called the critical use exemptions. So uh, basically, Growers were allowed to file exemptions to use methyl bromide for things like nut sedge control. However, um, the government um, decided to expire these exemptions at the end of 2016. So December 31st, 2016, the last use of methyl bromide in the United States occurred for fruit producers. However, we still actually use methyl bromide in our nurseries because clean stock is so important. And there are actually fields in, Me in Mexico, in central Mexico, that for fruit production where they still use methyl bromide. I was surprised about that, but um, very small amounts of it are still used in certain parts of Mexico. Um, but at least in the United States, the only time it's used is in nursery production and there are some nurseries that are looking at organic production and they're trying to produce 
organic plants, but um, it's on a small scale and they haven't, um, it's been difficult. We have a couple of organic nursery fields and we've had several disease challenges that we've had to deal with. So just a couple pictures of uh, fumigation. So this is um, flat fumigation or broadcast fumigation. And this is um, when a grower decides to fumigate the whole field. So not just the, uh, the uh, plastic, not just the beds, but the entire acreage. It can be more expensive, but um, this is recommended when a grower has soil borne disease issues because you are fumigating more than just the beds. Um, you're also fumigating the furrows. However, um, the use of chlorpicrin is actually uh, trickier and um, it requires larger buffer zones and um, it's difficult to fumigate near roads and uh, near any kind of structures. And so um, in order to, uh, to use these fumigants, growers get credits if they fumigate in line meaning if they actually use the drip tape um, to fumigate the beds rather than a flat fumigation. And so they're allowed to fumigate closer to structures and closer to, uh, to roads. And um, they're allowed to use acreage that they wouldn't be able to if they did a flat fumigation. However, um, through various studies, we have recognized that inline fumigation is less effective. The chemicals are not distributed as well in the beds this way. And so you tend to get less um, coverage on the shoulders, on the edges of the bed. And, um, and typically that's where we see soil borne disease first emerge. So right as we were phasing out methyl bromide, um, we started to see the development of these brand new diseases or what we thought was new in the state of California. So Macrophemina phaseolina um, was first described in 2008, but it actually showed up a, a few years earlier. So Steve Koike discovered that. Um, and then uh, Fusarium uh, oxysporum, Forma specialis frigere, was, uh, was also described again in, two th well, here it is in 2009. And um, the, this was described by Steve Koike, who was the extension agent at the time, and Tom Gordon. And I'm not sure who Kilpatrick is. Maybe it's a student that worked with him. So um, these pathogens did um, uh, become more apparent as we were phasing out methyl bromide and um, doing alternative uh, fumigation tactics. So just a couple pictures. The picture on the bottom right is the picture I took. You don't often see the microsclerotia in the vasculature of the, the, the strawberry crown, but I thought this was really interesting. So those little black dots are the overwintering or the over some, yeah, the overwintering structure um, of macrophemina. Um, here's a picture of Fusarium oxysporum. So Fusarium wilt and um, a lot of these soil borne diseases, well, all of them are very difficult to tell apart. So you either have to do DNA diagnostics or classical plant pathology and plate on selective media. And it can be really difficult to, um, to distinguish the pathogenic strains of Fusarium oxysporum from others. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about verticillium wilt. Um, I actually was out in a field last year where they had huge amounts of loss um, of one of our cultivars. And this was actually due to a fumigation failure. Um, so Trifel had fumigated, they did it in line and um, some of the lines were clogged. And so a 20 acre portion of the field did not get its, um, the recommended rate. And this is the devastation that happened. Um, so you can see that um, when you have fumigation failures or um, also um, growers don't always own their land, so they'll lease their land. And um, sometimes they'll be part of a large conglomerate where they don't um, share information. And so a grower will be given a field that has a known history 
of soulborn disease, but it's not made uh, made it uh, of acknowledgement to them, which is very upsetting um, because they could have chosen a cultivar that would have more resistance. And unfortunately, a lot of our cultivars are susceptible to verticillium wilt, but we have some really good genetics that have some resistance. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, so one of the main reasons why I feel like verticillium dahlia is an important pathogen is a good portion of our strawberries come from the Watsonville and Salinas area. And um, we uh, tend to rotate quite a bit with lettuce and leafy greens in this area. And lettuce is actually a host to verticillium. But the issue with that is that lettuce is in the field for a couple of months, whereas strawberries can be in the field for eight, nine months. Um, and as well, lettuce can tolerate a high colony forming units of microsclerotia per gram of soil in comparison to strawberries where some cultivars are susceptible to two or three microsclerotia per gram of soil. And because strawberries um, are produced year round in Watsonville and Salinas, our seasons are longer. I actually get a fair number of samples that have verticillium wilt. Um, it's harder to diagnose because it doesn't cause crown necrosis, um, but I do feel it's important. We also will find verticillium. I wanted to show you this cool diagnostic slide where it gives a summary of all the places we found verticillium. We have only found it a few times in Oxnard, and the, really the only locations we find it in Santa Maria are in organic ranches where they don't fumigate and where they also do a fair amount of rotation with leafy greens. So what is the main recommended recommendations to lettuce growers um, uh, when they have verticillium wilt? Well, they like to rotate with strawberry because then they can uh, get the benefits of fumigation without having to pay for it because um, the lettuce crop, they don't make enough money to really make that cost effective to make the fumigation cost effective. So I was invited out to a field last year um, right next to our Driscoll's cooler. And again, this is the situation where it was known that verticillium was in this field, but this is a new sharecropper, a new part of a new grower in this conglomerate. He was not um, given that advice. And we, this is actually where uh, one cultivar stops and another cultivar starts. And um, I have really dramatic images of having a uh, complete, uh, some beds having almost no plants in it, whereas the resistant cultivar, which planted, which is planted right next to it, which has the same CFUs, um, look perfectly fine. So um, anyway, so host resistance can be really important um, for managing soilborne disease. And the Strawberry Center is actually working on this. They have a table that they've um, put together with the UC Davis breeders that's available on the California Strawberry Commission website. And they actually rate plants um, for host resistance. And a lot of the information for verticillium and macrofemina were developed because of the results of the Strawberry Center and their fields where they do these host resistance assays. So this can be really helpful to growers if they actually know the history of their disease, if they, of their field. So um, moving right along, I'm not gonna spend too much time on um, soil, soil borne disease management because unfortunately we don't have a lot of answers um, or recommendations. Obviously, we don't have methyl bromide anymore. There have been so many studies looking at putting substrate on top of the beds to try to manage soil borne disease. There's um, been studies on anaerobic soil disinfestation. Um, I've been involved in steam trials where they have these huge pieces of equipment that uh, guzzle down diesel um, that can only go um, a couple of acres a day to steam the soil. Um, there's some new fumigants that might come out, but we're still waiting on Dominus um, to be labeled in California. So right now it's not something that, um, that a lot of growers can use. 
And um, if you follow the work done uh, at the Strawberry Center, they have done a lot of chemigation trials. And I'm not sure if we've seen a lot of efficacy um, with putting chemicals through the drip for macrofemina or verticillium. And a lot of it has to do with understanding the timing of infection, but also just how do you, how do you get the chemicals where they need to be? And a lot of these pathogens have microsclerotia or really thick chlamydospores. So, um, so there's no really good answer besides you using fumigants at this point to control soulborne disease, except for host resistance. And I really feel like breeding is going to uh, help us, but you have to have the knowledge of these pathogens and understand where they are. All right, so I have five to eight minutes or so to talk about gray mold and powdery mildew, but I'm gonna stop um, so that if people have any questions about soulborne diseases, I know there's someone studying verticillium and, um, and maybe there's other students that are in, you know, interested in, in these topics. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I was wondering, what do you think about using brassica crops as cover crops to manage soil borne diseases for organic strawberry production? So what do I think? So cover crops can be really helpful um, for, uh, especially in organic, because you obviously have to have rotational crops and they do recommend brassica. Um, I think they can be helpful, but if you have uh, a decent amount of soil borne disease, I don't think they're going to be the answer. For instance, Dominus is a fumigant uh, that uh, has a product in it called uh, uh, allelo isothiocyanate. Um, and it is a breakdown product from Brassica, but it's concentrated something like a thousand times or even more than that. And that is effective. But um, when it's naturally produced in the plant, it's at such low levels that it might have some impact. But if you have um, a lot of disease pressure, it's probably going to be minimal. But it would be better to use brassica as a cover crop, which doesn't promote these pathogens, than using something that might um, increase these pathogens. So there's been several studies on fusarium where some crops like raspberry would be really bad because even though it's not a host, um, the like as far as disease goes, it can promote uh, Fusarium oxysporum fragere. So, um, so just even choosing the the right cover crop can be really important to make sure that you don't increase your soilborne disease. So, I think brassica is a good choice. It's just not going to um, to to really control that soilborne disease. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Ivers, I'm Jack. I'm the grad student working on the Verticillium Well Project. I have a couple questions for you, but if you want to talk about the mold and the mildews, I can wait till the end. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to talk to you about Verticillium. I'm sure you like to hear that I think it's really important, right? I know. <laughs> We're a little biased, but I agree with you. <laughs> don't listen to the Santa Maria growers tell you they don't have Verticillium because they do. They're just in denial or they've had PCAs that um, aren't very good pathologists. So we can talk about that later. Um, okay, I will, I'm gonna move on to powdery mildew and botrytis. I know someone else is studying botrytis. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about these diseases. Uh, yeah, so the PCA exam, when I took it, they asked what Spherotheca macularis was and um, I got really mad. I've taken the PCA exam twice and uh, they expected people to know that it was strawberry powdery mildew or rose powdery mildew. But it's, that's actually an old name and the new name is Podospora aphanis. Well, it's not new, but um, it's, it's the, new ter the new terminology. Um, it is an obligate parasite and the primary reason why it's a problem is because it, um, causes purpling and necrosis and will reduce the photosynthetic area on the leaves, which can impact yield. You can also get it on fruit. And um, we don't have a lot of resistance to it, but some varieties 
get it more than others. And usually it does require fungicide applications during the summer when you have a lot of disease pressure. And unfortunately, if you get populations established, it can be really difficult to control with chemicals. So just a couple pictures. The early stages of powdery mildew cause leaf curling. So if you get this cupping of the leaves, um, that is a good indication of powdery mildew. And if you let it go too long, it can impact your fruit. You'll have this white mycelium. So people always wanna know why, do you, why does it occur on the undersides of the leaves first? And um, what's really interesting is if you ever watch a strawberry leaf unfurl, like uncurl, the part that's exposed to the environment is the undersides. And um, the young succulent tissue is actually much more susceptible to powdery mildew than the older leaves. So often you'll see that powdery mildew on the underside of the leaves. One, because there's not as much UV um, on the undersides, but two, it gets inoculated by the environment as the young leaves are growing. So these are the conditions that are conducive to powdery mildew. Um, so if you have conditions outside of this range, it's harder to get infections. So if you do studies in the greenhouse, um, et cetera, if you have really warm temperatures or um, if you don't have shade, it's really hard um, to do powdery mildew trials. Um, leaf wetness also can be really limiting. So um, growers do actually like to use overhead irrigation. Um, some of the things that growers do to manage powdery mildew is that immediately after planting, they'll overhead irrigate their plants, mainly for plant establishment, but it also helps reduce powdery mildew. Sometimes they'll put wettable sulfur into that overhead irrigation, um, the last set of um, uh, overhead irrigation. And then they'll be on a very routine fungicide program, especially during the summer plantings when you know you have a susceptible variety. And um, there was a student that um, was Dr. Holmes' student named um, Michael Palmer, who actually looked at fungicide sensitivity um, in Podospora fanus and um, wrote a thesis and has a publication in plant disease. So there are definitely products that are more effective than others. And it was really interesting to learn that the mycobutanol and some of the FRAC3 chemistries might be really prone to resistance development. Um, one of the projects that I've been involved in is this nighttime UVC application where um, UVC is applied at night. Um, it only um, reaches the plants for a couple of seconds and um, it's just as effective as a weekly fungicide program, but um, I'm not sure if it's really going to be adopted because it has to be done at night um, the powdery mildew fungus has a mechanism to use sunlight to repair its DNA. So um, they have found that four hours of darkness after the UVC application is much more effective. And um, this is a dragon that we built. So let me see if it, no, my video didn't work. Oh, well, you don't need to see the video. Um, all right, so that's powdery mildew. So it's mainly managed with fungicides, um, with, um, with uh, understanding the, well, it's mainly managed with fungicides. And um, one of the really interesting things is that uh, you can actually get infected nursery plants. So it can be a clean stock issue. A couple years ago in Florida, we had a couple of varieties that were brand new that were not adopted by growers because they came infected with mildew. And it was really hard to manage powdery mildew, especially in the Florida environment. And so growers just didn't like those varieties. So it can really kill a new variety if you have clean stock issues. So even powdery mildew can be a clean stock program uh, problem. And um, nurseries have all the same diseases that we have. Um, and they have to be better at managing them. So the last disease I'm gonna talk about is botrytis or gray mold. And um, I'm just gonna zoom through these pictures. Um, the fungus is everywhere. You should just assume it's in your field. Um, it likes dead plant material. It uh, likes young material. 
It needs free water to germinate and infect. And the really interesting thing is it's got a wide temperature range. So even at low temperatures, it can grow on your transplants, your frigo plants in uh, cold storage. And we have actually seen box rot when uh, plants are stored properly or when they have botrytis issues going into the box. So a couple of pictures, um, uh, it can blight flowers. Um, and usually the flowers get infected first before, um, before you'll see it on the fruit. And it produces masses of conidia fours. Um, if you have an opportunity to watch this video, um, Dr. Holmes shared it with me. It's actually a video out of Clemson with a woman named Madeline Downing that um, is great at phytographics. And she has made this cute little video of not just strawberry gray mold, but anthracnose and different um, life cycles. And she highlights the different inoculum sources um, because Botrytis scenario has a very wide host range. Um, it can grow on several crops and weed species. It typically infects the flowers um, when, uh, when, they're, when the plants are flowering and then will um, colonize those flowers and can cause um, pre-harvest and post-harvest rot issues. Um, growers in California don't like to use tunnels in Baja because they are organic producers. They do actually grow in tunnels. Um, tunnels act like umbrellas and they keep free moisture off the plants. So the key for organic growers is, to, is really moisture management because um, organic Botrytisides are not very effective. They just don't work. I haven't seen one that's been very effective. Um, There's several things like bed orientation or reducing plant spacing, et cetera, that could also be effective. One of the things that California has yet to adopt, but I know the Strawberry Center is working on it, is actually doing forecasting um, to see if you could time fungicide applications, but maybe, um, are we overspraying? Do we need to spray? So those are really um, interesting things that the Strawberry Center is working on. And I would love to know more about that. Um, so yeah, and I have talked to a number of organic producers and the main reason that they, the main way they control botrytis in their summer planting is cultivar selection. They know that cultivar A and B um, are highly susceptible and they also know the fields that they're growing in and which ones are more prone to botrytis. So fields that are closer to the coast um, have more wind movement and et cetera. And so they actually, under, because they've had a lot of problems in the past, they know which fields are more prone to mildew and they will not put their highly susceptible genetics in, uh, in a field that's prone to mildew because we've been trying to do UVC trials and we want mildew and they won't put certain susceptible cultivars in fields that we know are prone to mildew. So I've been arguing with them. So they've kind of already figured it out, but it's really, it can be difficult to organically imagine, uh, manage botrytis. Um, and I'm just gonna put a stick in for um, all of the fungicide tables that have been developed through graduate student research, through um, Kyle's work through Dr. Holmes's work where they have evaluated uh, fungicide efficacy, not just for botrytis, but several other pathogens. And um, his group has also focused on fungicide resistance, not just in powdery mildew, but also in botrytis. And um, I was lucky to be a part of that and um, meet Dr. Schnabel. And, um, and so there's a lot of really good resources to understand which chemistries are prone to resistance in not just podospora, but also botrytis. And as a side note, like our blueberry growers can no longer use fenhexamid because they spray it and botrytis builds up in the clamshell and they leave a few extra flowers in there from the blueberry. We have blueberries that have floral debris attached to them. They leave any kind of floral debris in the clamshell and then they ship it for a week or so over to China and the whole clamshell is full of um, botrytis, even though they've sprayed fenhexamid. So a lot of this work can be related to other systems, um, but it's 
really great and uh, really informative information. And so with that, um, my last slide is just um, that Botrytis is also a post-harvest pathogen and you really have to have uh, rapid cooling. I know they're really trying to get berries to the cooler within an hour and uh, maintain that those temperatures in order to reduce Botrytis. And then with that, I will take any questions. That is a strawberry petiole. I did not do any um, augmentation of the picture. It's actually the vascular system that is smiling at us. And that petiole has verticillium uh, hair and a verticillium beard. So you can look at that while you guys ask me questions. What questions do you have for Dr. Ivers? You're welcome to go back, Jack, to your verticillium question, if you like. Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, Dr. Ivers, if you're having a specific time of year, you're getting a lot of verticillium samples brought into you. Just during our both genetic cultivar trials and our crop term, we've seen you know a really high increase, like end of April and during May right now. Yeah, so when we tend to get our verticillium samples, um, so if I get a strawberry sample and it looks like, you know, based on the symptomology in the field, it looks like a soil-borne disease. If I get that in February, um, I think it's either two things. It's either Phytophthora that came in on the plant, it's a clean stock issue, or in a really heavily infested field, or it's verticillium. So usually um, we see macrophemina and fusarium uh, starting in May. Sometimes we'll see it a little more, a little earlier. So if you get a strawberry sample and it's the temperatures have been really cool, verticillium actually is able to cause disease when the soil temperatures are much cooler. So we've gotten samples as early as um, February um, uh, with verticillium and I think even January in Santa Maria. So I could look at um, my, my spreadsheet and see. So yeah, so it's really cool. It's a pathogen year round, whereas um, Fusarium and Macrophemina tend to, tend to like more of the warmer temperatures. Fusarium though, you can find it earlier than Macrophemina, but still Verticillium is even earlier. Okay, interesting, thank you. And then do you recommend for you, Chen and myself when we're doing diagnostics with PARP and NP10s, do you think we should put those in the dark instead of leaving? I do. I mean, I don't like to tell people what to do, but I would. <laughs> Okay. Less important for um, the NP10 mm -hmm. is for the PARP, but yeah, for the PARP, um, you have to put it in a box okay. or put it in, it has to be in the dark. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe uh, you should come up to my last time. Go ahead, you Chen. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, how do you think the PCA license is helping you in your career as a plant pathologist? And the second one is for you to uh, diagnose this disease uh, globally. Did they ship over here? Do you need to be certified quarantine lab to do that? How is the uh, uh, requirement? Yes. For us to re receive samples, um, international samples, we have to have an APHIS permit. And they come in and inspect your lab and make sure that you have the right laminar flow hood. We have like a international room. So we have a room in the back that is locked and we have the laminar type A2 uh, biosafety cabinets. You guys have one at the Strawberry Center. Um, and uh, so we, we have permits and um, uh, most countries will allow you to ship samples. But there are a few countries in South America, like Costa Rica and a, a couple countries where they don't want their biodiversity being shipped out. So even, even if we could receive samples from them, they can't ship us. But it's just a few. It's like Ecuador and we don't really grow a lot in those. So um, I actually get samples quicker from Australia than I do from Baja, Mexico. I It takes 10 to 20 days to get samples from Baja, Mexico because there's no FedEx or UPS. They have to drive all the way up to Ensenada to drop off samples because they have no FedEx or over, overnight shipping um, carriers. 
So it's, it's, it's insane. I'll get within three or four days, I'll get samples from Sydney, whereas it takes me 10 days, 12 days to get samples from Mexico. So it's, it's a little convoluted, but um, anyway, so that's your answer on that. Um, so yes, you can, but you have to have the right permits. Um, I heard that like five years ago, they were getting samples without having any of the permits. And so you can get in trouble. Um, and, you know, we, just like you guys, you, we submit uh, things to the CDFA. We give them a list of all the cultures and stuff that we've collected inside the state of California. And then we have to do the same thing with APHIS. So now that we're working on Neopestalociopsis, we have to uh, get that approved. Um, and then they'll tell us whether we can work on it in a greenhouse setting, um, just in the lab or et cetera. So, um, so yeah, so there's so many different regulations, not just with receiving plants, but then what you're gonna do with the cultures afterwards. Um, and as far as my PCA, I do have a PCA. I don't use it very much. I am really frustrated with the whole process because I, have been doing plant pathology for 30 years. And I think that exam is outdated. Um, there are a dozen questions on there that have no right answers. I've told the, um, I've told the examiners, like, again, Gerald, would you be, I, you know, I said, do I have to teach the students the wrong name so they can pass your exam? I bet you that Sphero Thika question is still on there. And it's like, okay, so Am I gonna have to tell all the students that Podospora Spanis is really called Spherothica when it's not? So things like that. So I understand about why we need PCAs and I understand about the exams. I hopefully they're going, maybe during COVID they've decided to revamp their exams. I don't know. Um, I do think that uh, it's important to regulate pesticides. And so having educated people give recommendations is really important. Um, so I don't know if the PCA has really, besides credibility, um, I don't know if it's really, um, helped me. Plus I have to, I have to get, I have to like, listen to these classes. I have to get my units. Like right now, I think I only have 10. So I'm going to have to listen to more webinars to like, I'm going to have to go to the strawberry center field day to get my, uh, to get some of my units. Well, we can help you out that, with that one. But <laughs> I know what you mean. You got to be always figuring out how you can get the hours to keep your license current. Yeah. Other questions for Dr. Ivers? 